Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning uh, from uh, Vienna, Austria. Uh, we will be talking today in this discussion event about European solidarity, about the perspectives from the Southern EU member states on European solidarity. I think uh, it is a very good time actually, and a very timely topic, European solidarity, because in the midst of uh, the health crisis and the Corona pandemic in which we are, questions regarding European solidarity are of course uh, all over the place. And if you look um, at the concept of European solidarity, you will find it actually in all the different policy areas uh, of the different political levels from the local national to the European level, in fact. Um, what we see in, uh, on the European level, of course, is um, the, a European solidarity, which is the, at the core, which is at the basis of European action. If you look at um, financial and uh, economic the financial and economic architecture of the European Union, you always find uh, the principle of solidarity as a basis of action. But also, if you look at different other policy areas from climate action to health, from education to the migration issue, or if you just look at foreign policy or the four freedoms uh, as such, you find that um, there's a... a, a, a uh, a, a very concrete uh, element of European solidarity beneath the uh, various decisions, actions, strategies uh, of the European Union. Uh, you will find European solidarity many times uh, in declarations and uh, maybe uh, not so often in action, but this is actually where the tension comes in. Uh, European solidarity as a concept, because we all understand something different uh, regarding uh, solidarity as a concept. European solidarity is always under stress, and it is always under construction, in particular in in difficult and challenging and crisis times. Um, the basis of our discussion today is this book here. I show you the cover, if you can see it. Uh, this book, which is called European Solidarity in Action and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capitals. Uh, it is a book which is coordinated by TEPSA and edited by Michael Kedding, Johannes Pollock, Pollock and myself. And this book, actually, I will show the cover again. It is now uh, being uh, produced. It is actually, well, the content is finished, but it is, it is under production and it will be published uh, in December and January this year. And the good thing with this book is, which is the basis of our discussion today, is that, well, some may say this is a bad thing, but I would say this is an advantage. It is not a scientific textbook. It is rather a thriller, I would say, or a um, travel book, maybe, a travel guide because it takes the reader on a journey through the different perceptions, different thinkings and different concepts of European solidarity. Because different countries, depending on their geography, history and culture have different viewpoints on European solidarity. Are they more on the receiving side or do they actually provide European solidarity? And um, what does geography have to do with it? Where are their, their priorities? You will find in this um, book 41 contributions from 41 analysts from 41 countries, from 41 European countries. So it's the EU 27 plus um, countries like Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, Turkey, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, and, and of course the countries of the Western Balkans um, because they, they are all part of uh, Europe, uh, not of the European Union, but of Europe, and they all have and an opinion on European solidarity. And uh, this is the interesting thing because you see so many angles and so many different approaches to European solidarity and so many different priorities. For example, those that have, that have a border with Russia 
have a special interest in uh, foreign policy and security issues and European solidarity. Those, for example, in the Mediterranean, and we'll talk about it uh, in a couple of minutes, they have other issues um, like uh, the issue of economic solidarity and financial solidarity or, or, or how to manage uh, the, the external border and the migration and, and asylum issue, for example. And we also see that in times of crisis, even those regions where we think that they actually um, are even more interdependent and coordinate even more, have a better understanding of each other even more than other European countries, like for example, the Baltic states or the Benelux states, you will see in this, in this book that they had their trouble themselves in, in uh, the, the, very, uh, the, the corona health crisis. And then you will find other countries who would say, well, we, there is a historical debt that other countries have with us. So uh, we have a right to receive European solidarity. Other countries who would say, don't moralize us, European solidarity as something which is, um, which is pushed upon them to convince them to do something that they don't really want to do. And then you have countries like Ireland, for example, just to give you an, another uh, example in the book, which is very interesting, where um, you have an upgrading of European solidarity, which means that during the Brexit uh, negotiations, the solidarity between the EU um, countries was a big advantage for Ireland. But on the other hand, for example, if you look at the Schengen area, which Ireland has joined, or the tax issue, you find that... Um, maybe Ireland is not uh, showing enough solidarity there, depending on your point of view. But we also have, for example, our colleague uh, from the UK who writes about uh, European solidarity and who says that, well, the UK might have been very surprised in the Brexit, situ in the Brexit negotiations that there was actually so much cohesion uh, between the EU countries that they were talking with one voice. So 41 articles, easy to read, no footnotes, no scientific sources, opinion pieces, concise, uh, which take you on a journey uh, through uh, Europe and the European Union. And I would very much recommend that book if you're interested in that. Now, coming to our panel today, uh, I'm really glad that we're going to talk about uh, um, the South and uh, we're going to talk with representatives from, from um, Southern members of the European Union about European solidarity today. And uh, I would like to uh, quickly uh, present the panel and I would like to uh, welcome Eleonora Poli, which of course many of you know. Hi, Eleonora, ciao. Ciao, oh, hello, good morning, everybody. Eleonora um, wrote her piece um, together with a colleague of hers, uh, Nicoletta Pilozzi. Um, as a senior fellow at the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Roma. Thank you for joining us, Eleonora. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Alice Cunha. Alice, no? I have to say. Good morning from Lisbon, everyone. Good morning from Lisbon. Good morning uh, to you from Vienna. Uh, welcome. Uh, Alice, as you know, she's a research fellow at the Portuguese Institute of International Relations at the Nova University in Lisbon, Portugal. And I would like to uh, welcome, she's not with us today, but she sent a video, she's on maternal leave, our colleague from Greece, uh, Eugenia uh, Kopsidi. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research assistant at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki and a resident lecturer at the European Law and Governance School. And she uh, sent a, a, um, a video um, summarizing her point of views and her article in our book, and we will, we will show you and broadcast the video a little later on. But I would also like to welcome, of course, uh, good morning, Ignacio Molina from Madrid. Hello, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, Ignacio. Um, he is, as you know, a senior analyst at the Elcano Royal Institute in Madrid and a professor and lecturer at uh, the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, I would say. I used Spanish. Expression. That's correct. Well, thank you for being with us and let's, let's get into the discussion. And if you um, who are listening want to get in um, 
and ask a question or give your comments and get into the discussion, please send your comments via the Q&A and I will bring them into the debate. Uh, my name is Paul Schmidt from the Austrian Society of European Politics here in Vienna. Now, let me, let me start with you, Eleonora. Um, I, of course, read your article in the book, which, going to be, which is going to be published soon. It's my privilege to have already read it. <laughs> um, there is, um, Italy has lived through a poly crisis, no? Um, financial and economic crisis, the crisis of migration policy, as, as I would call it, and of course, uh, the uh, pandemia situation, which was very, very crucial in, in Italy, as we know. What are the lessons learned or what, has, what have those crises actually made uh, with, what is their impact on European solidarity in Italy? Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yes, Italy has been going through, I think, some, some couple of dark years, like I think the majority of countries in the world. Um, what is particular about Italy is that uh, even before the pandemic, uh, the sentiments uh, towards the EU were not um, actually so positive. Um, Italy used to be one of the most pro-European countries and, and back being uh, one of the most anti-European countries after maybe the UK. This is because of different reasons you were mentioning, you know, the financial crisis and mostly the migration crisis. And it's not just the crisis per se, the, the fact that we had migrants coming to Italy, but the fact also that many political parties were building their propaganda, I would say, or the political campaign by creating, you know, by identifying in migration um, the enemy, like, you know, the issue that was making Italians being or feeling worst. Um, then the pandemic arrived and at, at the beginning, at the, in the, the, the first month, I would say, of the pandemic, we didn't hear a very strong European response. And at the time in spring 2020, we had around 73% of Italians believing that the EU was abandoning Italy again. This of course is a matter of perception, but then perception matters when you know people have go to vote or you know express their political idea. Um, the situation has radically changed as you know the European institutions and European member countries have started, have started to act uh, if you consider, if you have a look at the European Solidarity Tracker, you would see that Italy was uh, one of the countries benefiting the most of European solidarities, meaning that other European member countries were somehow contributing or helping Italy in facing, you know, the pandemic. And this had, uh, together, we know, with the European institutions' actions, such as the next, European, the next, um, next generation EU, certainly helped um, to change this kind of feelings. And if you consider the last data is that 50%, 57% of the Italians now are in favor of the European Union, which is not great, it's good, but it's not a super positive trend because it means that we have 32% that you know, are still um, for Ital exit. But if you compare this data to what we had in spring 2020, when you know we had 40, only 48% were in favor of you, is still you know a good a good result. I would say that what has changed mostly the perception is of course um, the money that will come to Italy to 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 recover basically from not just the pandemic but also the crisis we had before. And my idea is that of course it's good. It's a good, you know, gesture is a sign of European solidarity, the fact, you know, that European member countries have decided, you know, to put together resources and finance, you know, all European countries in order to rebuild our common economy. This is good on the paper, but then the perception I have, you know, talking to the Italians is that there is a sort of money washing, you know, that we are pro-European because now the European Union is providing for our economy. So it's not greenwashing, uh, it's money washing, actually. Yeah, it's money washing. So, money laundering, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no. So the, the idea is that 
fine, yes, we should rebuild our economies, but it's important more than ever now that we have, we communicate what the EU is doing, what European member countries are doing, uh, apart from, you know, making the economy more welfare-oriented, you know, by financing, you know, different projects. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be the same, you know, Italians used to be pro-European, was one, it was absolutely convenient to be members of the European Union because they believed that, you know, by being members of the European Union, Italy had a better stage or, you know, institution worked better than national government. So they had some kind of material return. Uh, we have now to educate people to the importance of being part of the European project, not just because it makes people wealthier, but because, you know, it's a sort of also a political project for better institutions, better democracy, better rights, etc., etc. Uh, but Eleonora, if you say that we have now to educate the people that it is not only about money, but also about uh, political integration. I mean, Italy is a founding member of the European no. Um, but this has been I mean, better, better late than never, but how come this, this has never happened? The fact is that we have been going through years of anti-European propaganda. And now uh, you have many Italians not being anti-European because all this anti-European propaganda has kind of stopped because those parties that were more vocal against the EU are now members of the Draghi's government and they cannot basically say the EU is not doing anything for us while you know, we receive funding from the European Union. So this anti-European political propaganda has somehow, some, somehow stopped. But at the same time, we have to rebuild you know, from the basis, from students, from you know, even children, the idea that we are member of the European Union, we are funding member of the European Union, and this is not just because we want to be wealthier, but because we want to be better democracy or we want to build a better future or better institutions, or better human rights, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, um, education and, and, and just the, the awareness that actually uh, the European integration matters is, of course, something, uh, it, it is a continuous work. It is always work in progress, yes. and it probably never stops. And it also has to be, um, has to be, uh, pass from one generation to the next one. And, uh, and Paul, uh, if I can add something else. Please do. On migration, like migration used to be the top you know, Italian priority in terms of challenges. Now, you know, it's the third one after, you know, climate change and uh, the pandemic. And it's not just because we have less migrants coming. Uh, it's because, you know, we have less propaganda on how migration is an issue or how migration is affecting the, the life of citizens. It's not that migrants have disappeared. It's just that we have, it, it, migration is, is still not used as an instrument, as a political instrument, you know, to, be, to build political support under hates, basically, or mm -hmm. haters. So we have to, you know, contrast this anti-European or uh, Eurosceptic or uh, populist propaganda by, you know, providing education, providing data and, you know, making people understand that there is something more than, you know, money or funding or financing project. But even, even financing and money is, uh, of course, having an impact on, on many, many different areas. I think sometimes the important thing is... Um, to let people know that where this financial support comes from is actually uh, the the European Union, and and not just the mayor or the or the the Italian government. And I wanted to ask you, I don't know if the impact of the next generation EU recovery uh, recovery package can already be felt, uh, but what is um, once it is implemented, and, and I think that the first. Uh, uh, financial support uh, is is actually uh, sent to the countries. Once mm -hmm. once it is implemented, what impact do you actually expect? I think normal citizens do not still feel the the the, 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 the money that has arrived. You know, there is a lot of talking. So of course, the project, the government is implementing the projects basically through which you know money will be spent, but. For normal people, for normal normal citizens, this is something still far to be to be to be felt. What has changed is the fact that Italians know that the European Union is providing for the support, and we have a government 
which is, you know, less uh, media vocal, you know, Prime Minister Draghi is, first of all, everybody knows that he's, you know, pro-European, but also is less vocal on TV or on the media. And the times that this appears, he's always provided very clear data about what's going on. And he's very specific about saying, you know, the EU is providing this and we are a member of the European Union, we are a funding member, and the future of, of Italy is within the European Union. And this clarity of messages, I think, is helping Italians understanding the importance of being part of the of the European Union. Why, you know, other political leaders before, because they were political, and Draghi is not a politician, he is more technical, high-level technical, but he's not a politician. Before, they were using the European Union as a scapegoat to kind of conceal the mistake they were making or, you know, to, to gain or not more political traction. And this game has been going on since Berlusconi governments many years ago. And has been is, he done going, by... is he going to be president? <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. But, you know, you never say never. <laughs> I don't think. But uh, Eleonora, one, one more question, if I may. Um, I was wondering, um, how is the uh, joint procurement of uh, vaccines actually perceived in Italy? Is this something which is seen as um, a success story or is it criticized for being quite slow? It's not criticized. I think um, the main issue that passed about vaccination, well, there was some critics at the beginning, but now I think no one is complaining apart from those that do not want to get vaccinated. So, but this is another story. I think people that are pro-vaccination, they don't, they don't feel as something bad. It was at the beginning because there were, there were some delays, but now uh, the perception is rather good. Mm. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to give one example uh, from my Austrian perspective on Italy, uh, because it shows the whole contradiction of the discussion on European solidarity. When um, the discussion was on, on the volume of the next generation EU recovery package, the financial package, the 750 billion, uh, Austria forming part of the frugal four actually was critical and said, well, um, there are too, um, too many uh, subsidies and, and we should change the ratio with subsidies and loans with grants and loans. And um, one of the former Austrian chancellors then talked about the political system in Italy as being broken. And uh, second example, uh, there's a mountain close to Vienna where there was a big fire burning uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, which uh, we are not really used to um, uh, in difference to, to situations in your country where this happens. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, in during the summer time, very frequently, but it happened here, and we didn't have the equipment uh, to to stop the fire. Uh, so Italy, uh, apart from two or three other countries, sent airplanes, and all of a sudden, the broken system helped uh, the beautiful, well-functioning Austria uh, to fight the fire. And there were many people pointing that out. So sometimes, when you feel that you are strong. And you have to, and you want to help the weak. Maybe, maybe next week you are the weak, and others are the strong. So um, I would invite everyone uh, to um, put yourself in, in in the shoes of the the others, and and then try to uh, improve the understanding and and rethink uh, European solidarity. Uh, um, there are many prejudices which are actually passed on from generation to generation. And this is also something which we've seen in particular during the economic and financial crisis. And I think this is something that we have to find arguments against. And this is of course not, not so easy when you're confronted with a very uh, populistic um, media and, and a political class which, which, which uses those, uh, those, those, those opportunities. And we, we're still very much discussing within a national public sphere, uh, which uh, very rarely becomes Europe European or transnational. Having said that, Eleonora, you know, you know we come back to you, but let me move to Ignacio. Uh, Ignacio, um, in your article, you, you um, try to explain the contradiction, I would say, in Spain between a, or maybe it's not so much a contradiction, between the um, 
very pro-EU attitude, pro-integration attitude on the one hand, and then uh, a sort of uh, exaggerated self-perception of weakness in Spain, in the public, but also in the political class. How does this all um, have its impact on European solidarity and the way European solidarity is actually viewed uh, in Spain? Well, uh, this is much... Uh very much related to what you have just said about the feeling of being strong or feeling of being a very efficient country, what do you mention uh, the forest fire in, in Austria. Um, it's interesting that, that of course, Spain is a very pro-European country and I will make a reference to what Eleonora has said about the difference between Italy and Spain, because I really think that it's very interesting that we have many, so many factors under control and um, because of uh, how the political narrative of EU membership in both countries have been uh, managed differently, we have a different we have a different uh, result. But 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 the, first of all, uh, trying to answer to your question, it is absolutely uh, uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, counterintuitive it's that you think that you are, on the one hand you are very pro-European, on, on the other you feel that you are not particularly strong because you are in the periphery. I mean, geographically, you are in the periphery. Economically, you are poorer than the EU average. Uh, and, you've, and you have the feeling that your country, even if it's the fourth uh, larger member state in terms of votes in the council, GDP, population, uh, but, but you have the feeling, I mean, Spanish political elites and Spanish public opinion that the country is facing uh, so many challenges on the social, economic, uh, even in the constitutional uh, uh, domain, uh, and that the, the 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 that well historically even this idea that that Spain itself is a problem and Europe is the solution. And when you have this this narrative, this dominant narrative that that is Europe who is going to give you the solution to your national problem, uh, and you are very pro-European. And that European feeling is very much guided by the idea that you are weak and that you need help and that you need solidarity. So I really think that 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 in the case of Spain, this is very, in my view, this is very clear. But but if if, if I if I may going back to to what I mentioned about the contrast with Italy, it is really very interesting that that Spain, when you compare Italian situation and Spanish situation, is very similar in terms of first of all the uh, financial weakness during the, the during the eurozone crisis, uh, 2010, 2013, 14 more or less, at, uh, following the Great Recession, and also the the the, the, the migration crisis and the refugee crisis, uh, because Spain, uh, along with Greece and Italy and, and Malta, uh, is one of the the the, the, the most important gates of for, for flows of migration to to come to to Europe. So it's very, it's, it's quite similar. I mean, you. You may you may think well, Italy and Spain are dealing with the same challenges on the economic and the immigration side. Um, in both cases, the European response for, was of course very similar. But in the case of Italy, I think that Eleonora mentioned propaganda and, and also this this um, narrative of some political forces, both in the right and the left. And this is also interesting. No, both Faisa movement of both Lega and Brothers of Italy. I mean, for on, on the both spectrum of the political, uh, both sides of the political spectrum, um, trying to blame or blaming the European Union for for not helping Italy. And in the case of Spain, it's very interesting because no party on the left or the right considered the European Union to be responsible for that. It's particularly interesting in the case of Podemos, which is a very strong anti-establishment uh, party. But by the way, now in, in in the government, now in office, but 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 uh, uh, in 2014 when they they and the idea is that the problem for the the very complex uh, economic situation of Spain at that time was a uh, domestic. Uh, the reason was, I mean, the 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 misfunctioning of the of the state market relation, corruption in 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 local companies, but. But it was very, very, very. Uh, I mean, the 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 the, the, the proportion of the, of of um, blame to to Brussels or to Germany 
was really very very reduced in comparison with with Italy or with Greece or even Portugal, I, I think. And in the case of the migration crisis, exactly the same. I mean, uh, Spain is on the border. Uh, uh, we we are we are. Uh, I mean, also if you can if you include the Canary Islands, it's very obvious that that exactly as it happened in Greece or in Italy, we are in the external border of the European Union, facing Africa. Uh, but 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 was there was no a a, a dominant rela, a narrative in the political parties, in that case more right wing anti immigration parties that that was the European Union to be blamed, but rather well that that the Spanish government is not able to control the border, so it's very interesting how exactly the same factors are digested very differently in one country to other, and this of course has an impact about. Uh, the, the 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 assessment that 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 a Spanish population, Spanish citizens, Spanish elites do on, as compared with Greek or with Italian uh, on the European Union. I mean, it's it's uh, it's 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 interesting because it's a very different approach, no? Um, um, because the, the 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 statement of Spain is the problem, Europe is the solution, is of of course um, totally exaggerated. In both directions, and if yeah. we look, for example, at the uh, issue of the uh, Corona pandemia, I mean, we could say now at least Spain is the solution, and uh, in the center of the European Union we have a problem. I mean, uh, this changes, uh, and uh, I was wondering, is this cultural political approach to the European Union? Uh, in Spain also changing from one generation to the next one. I mean, you say in your article that if you think you're weak, calling for solidarity is no surprise in the sense that you benefit, you want to benefit from solidarity from the others, but you don't really want to provide solidarity or you don't see yourself in the situation to, 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 to provide European solidarity. Is this changing or is this just passed on from one generation to the next? What needs to be done to have a Spain which is big, which is strong, to have a Spain which punches not below, but at its on, weight? On its weight, yes. That's a very, very interesting question. And I mean, I, I, I don't have the data to answer, but I have an hypothesis on that. Um, well, if you look to the, I mean, the older generation, those who, those who uh, were born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, uh, so before Spain joined the European Union, when the European Union already existed under the Franco dictatorship and um, transition to democracy, so the idea was that 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 European membership was so long desired. And 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 by the way, very interesting because when Spain joined the European Community, the European Union, solidarity didn't exist. I mean, European Union uh, in the eighties was an, a common market without a regional uh, policy, just, well, very, I mean, compared with- Agriculture. With the, just only just agriculture, that's, 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 that's right. That's and without a, a foreign policy cooperation, um, 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 and the, 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 the desire to join the European Union was much more connected to the idea of, uh, we, we, we want to, to be a normal country, a normal Western European country with democracy, prosperity, but that was not the idea that we want to join the European Union to take money uh, because apart from, from agriculture policy, and, and, and remember that common agriculture policy was in the, in the 80s designed rather to, 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 to deal with Northern agriculture than with Mediterranean agriculture. But I mean, by, by the way, Spain, anyway, Spain was, we want to be member of the European Union in itself because that means that the, the country is a normal country, not, not because of the tra transactional approach, okay? Now with new generation, that is your, 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 your question, new generation are of course used to be member of the European Union. It's true that, that Spain still feels to be weak. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, much stronger than 20 or 30 years ago, uh, much more normal country, much more an average country. And this is of course, is something that I mean, new generation uh, are socializing in, 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 in a country, which is a, a normal country, even if we have so many problems from the point of view of our, I mean, uh, the future of Spain as a political community. But I mean, I, I really think that the new generation thinks that, that Spain is no longer a strange, uh, a rara avis in, in, in Europe. And then when you are uh, a normal 
uh, and a strong country in terms of, I mean, on your size and or, or, or GDP, of course, you have to think about provide solidarity and not just to receive in, in, uh, um, and regarding Eastern Europe, for example, or if you are a strong country and you have a relatively strong uh, diplomacy or even, I mean, uh, army, and you have to, uh, for example, police in the Baltic, uh, to protect the, the Baltic countries to the Russian ag uh, aggression, or you have to to help um, um, you have to help uh, Eastern European countries in terms of cohesion policy, and you have to be uh, a net contributor to the budget. Uh, I really think, I really think, and this is the hypothesis that you mentioned in the in the in the in the chapter, that Spain uh, will will I mean, and Spaniards will be happy with that. Uh, and 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 it has to do also with with the, the idea that that uh, that if you are very pre-European and you think that there is an European demos, an European political community at the end of the road, not 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 right now, but at the end of the road, you are willing to accept that you have European fellow country uh, and that you have to to and that you have to help them. Because politically, you have this idea that, 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 that this is a, a political community in the making. And this is, and I stop here, and this is linked to our internal debate uh, about how controversial Spanish as, as a political community is. So this Europe as, as something which is very consensual for left wing, right wing, Madrid, uh, Catalonia, and Basque country, the periphery for trade unions and, 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 and um, businessmen that the Europe is 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 uh, an object of consensus, and that we really think that we are European, and we really think we want to create a European community. So you are willing to help if if needed, if needed. At least at least in theory. Uh, well, we will see if this is also something that is actually implemented. At least in theory, we we'll talk about um, uh, the the practice. Uh later on, but let me move to Alice. And before I do that, uh, let me ask the audience to post the questions in the Q&A button below. And uh, I see there's already one question. Uh, I will take them up, uh, but I would like to move to Alice first and um, listen to her to explain us a little bit the situation in Portugal and the perception of European solidarity there. And my, my uh, question from reading your article in this book would be, uh, is European solidarity based only on economic contributions? Tricky question from your side. Uh, well, not obviously uh, no, but uh, financial and economic assistance and solidarity for Portugal has been quite important, not only after a session, but even uh, before. Uh, after the, the 1974 uh, Carnation Revolution, uh, the, the then European Economic Community provided with the economic uh, um, emergency aid for the country. It also uh, rene renegotiated the commercial agreement that existed between the country and the EC, and also provided pre-accession assistance for the country. So uh, European solidarity for the country goes back even before uh, the country joined the European Union. Over the years, as you know, Portugal has been a net recipient of the community budget. Uh, we have uh, received, we have a net balance of over uh, 70 bil uh, billion euros throughout 1986 until 2019. Uh, and even now during the pandemic, uh, the economic uh, recovery assistance program uh, has also been perceived as quite important for the social and economic recovery of the country. So um, the economic factor is, is quite important for the country. So actually, the, uh, uh, your response is yes. <laughs> actually, European solidarity is seen as, as uh, in, in its majority as an economic and financial contribution to Portugal. From the perspective of the receiver and yes, but Portugal has also been a provider of European solidarity in, uh, in, other, in other issues. For instance, 
uh, during the Central and Eastern enlargement round. Portugal was one of the countries that had most to lose uh, if those countries join the European Union. And still, uh, it agreed uh, on, the, on that enlargement because it, uh, it had um, a gratitude debt, if you, if you may, uh, on the subject, because uh, those countries were in a similar uh, situation that Portugal was in the late 70s and early 90s. They were, they were leaving uh, um, authoritarian regimes. They were also poorly developed as Portugal was uh, more than 20 years before. So there was a, a kind of gratitude debt towards uh, those countries and the EU in general, and the country was there also for them. Uh, throughout our 35 years of membership, Portugal has also joined uh, several humanitarian missions. Um, during the pandemic, it was also a solidarity provider on, uh, on some issues. For instance, it granted citizenship rights uh, for um, more than uh, 10,000 immigrants and asylum seekers that were in the country already seeking for residency applications. And it, it granted some rights such as for them to have access to health and social security. Uh, it all, it is- uh, You've turned off your microphone, Alice. Sorry, I pressed the button, uh, <laughs> not on purpose. It also accepted uh, children from uh, refugee camps uh, in Greece. Uh, and it also contributed with around, I, I believe, uh, 10 million euros to the coronavirus global response launched by the European Commission. So um, we, are, we have been net, we have been recipients of EU solidarity, but we have also been providers of uh, the same solidarity. Definitely. Um, as you like tricky questions, Alice, I have another one for you. I... <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the European integration, the European Union only works if member countries actually remember and stick to the rules that they have defined themselves. And I'm referring in particular now to the rule of law. And in your article, you mention one quotation by the Portuguese prime minister who says that rule of law should not be a condition to receive EU funding. Now we've seen, some of us have seen the coalition agreement of the new government forming itself in Berlin who say exactly the contrary, who say if the rule of law the rule of law is, is not, if the, the, the independence of a justice system and the rule of law is not guaranteed, there should be no EU fund. So what is the Portuguese position on this now? The Portuguese position is, 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 this, is that one. We think that the, the rule of law uh, is something that we are committed to. That particular statement of Prime Minister, Prime Minister Costa was issued during a particular time. It was during a, a visit to Hungary when the multi-annual financial framework was being discussed among member states. And that also corresponds to a first moment when the, the Portuguese government and the Portuguese in general considered that the European Union was failing some countries. For instance, why was Portugal on the black list of mandatory quarantine uh, uh, for some member states, such as Belgium or Finland, if it was even considered at some point as a model case regarding the measures that it had adopted to face the pandemic crisis? Or where was the EU uh, not helping the Spanish or the Italians, which, which were also being severed yet? That was the first moment during the, the first lockdown between March, April last year, that the Portuguese see, uh, have seen the, a more technocratic uh, Europe and not a really political driven project, a solidarity driven one. So the, that particular statement of Prime Minister Costa um, 
was probably a way to pressure the other member states in order to reach an agreement regarding the next generation EU and also the multi-annual financial agreement, because it is really important for the country to have financial and economic resources to face um, the social and economic recovery. Why? As you know, Portugal is heavily dependent uh, on tourism. Uh, it was heavily affected by this pandemic and it has to have the means in order to recover. So, uh, but that particular dimension does not contradict our commitment as a country regarding the, the values uh, of the European Union project. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I mean, uh, at this point in time, Portugal is, of course, a, a role model for many of us when it comes to the, to the rate of vaccination, uh, for example. Now, what we've seen at the beginning of the uh, corona crisis was, of course, as we have uh, 27, 27 different health systems, which are coordinated on the national level, that everyone was trying to, um, to organize it themselves uh, closing borders, uh, shielding and protecting the health system, um, trying to um, define and decide upon the rules to follow on a national basis. But that actually uh, very quickly um, vanished because actually um, everyone found out that uh, by closing the border, you, you cannot stop a virus, so you better do it together. And that's where the joint uh, procurement came in and... Um, the vaccination certificate to travel came in, all with 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 all still lacking uh, efficiency and lacking data and lacking coordination, mm -hmm. but um, learning in a crisis that it's not only that the, it's not only important who has which political level has actually the competence, but how do you coordinate in in a crisis situation, Cri the real crisis management, which is one lesson we have to learn, which we have to improve. Uh, thank you, uh, Elise. Uh, let me now ask the TAPSA secretary to, to play the video by Eugenia Kopsidi, who cannot be here. She's in Greece, but she has something to tell us. Yes, Please. I will run away. Hello and welcome to TAPS Explainers. My name is Eugenia Kopsidi and I'm a resident lecturer at the European Law and Governance School. In today's video I'm going to talk about the European solidarity in times of migration crisis and especially about the Greek case. There is one main point that I would like you to take with you after the video. That is that the so-called refugee crisis which broke out in summer 2015 and is still in progress constitutes a phenomenon that concerns all of Europe. However, instead of a dynamic and unified response, a few member states were forced, due to their geographical location, to bear the full weight of the crisis. Italy and Greece, being at the external borders of the European Union, have been the first countries of entrance for refugees and migrants and therefore the responsible ones to examine their demands for international protection according to the Dublin regulation. At the same time, the effectivity of the important humanitarian action in Europe has been impeded by the lack of political will on the part of European governments and the inability to achieve a consensus on migration policy. The result is that this European migration policy has been mainly limited to the externalization process of the European borders. The EU agreement with Turkey in March 2016, aiming at discouraging the inflows of refugees to enter the European territory through Greece by returning them to Turkey, confirms this primary goal of the European Union. In addition, the common European asylum system has proven insufficient to deal with the worst displacement crisis since the Second World War. The Dublin regulation mechanism, the lack of relocation quotas, the total inability to legally enter the European territory, and the given priority to safety instead of protection of human rights clearly explain Europe's solidarity deficit. The new Pact on Migration and Asylum seems to recognize the need for solidarity at the European level 
placing the fair sharing of responsibility at one of its main pillars. It remains to be seen whether the European governments will reach the necessary minimum political consensus in order to guarantee a new framework offering safety, security and decent living conditions for men, women and children arriving to Europe. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next Steps Explainer. Well, Eugenia, thank you for the TAPS explainer, which you sent in, and we would have liked to have you here now to ask a couple of questions. But um, you can read all her analysis and her recommendation in the book, which I mentioned, European Solidarity in Action and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capitals. Um, but let me uh, use this migration issue to go back to Eleonora and um, to, to see what we have in our chat function here. But on this migration issue, I mean, Migrants, refugees are used as a political instrument. Today, we've seen that uh, in Greece, we see that in Italy, we see that on the Belarusian-Polish border. Uh, we've also seen that in uh, between Spain and, and Morocco. Um, we also see that uh, from 2015 onwards, um, the big solution to this issue, the lack of a European action in this area, coordinated action is of course due to uh, different uh, interests and different opinions in the EU capitals. And we, we move around a little bit in a roundabout where we don't really find uh, the joint exit uh, to a joint and common asylum and, and, and migration policy. What is your feeling here? Um, is How can we improve? I mean, there is European solidarity there, which we don't in the, read in the media every day. We have a coalition of the willing. I think Alice also mentioned uh, the, the Portuguese contribution, that, that there are actually countries which help bringing, bringing young people um, from the, the refugee camps to um, Two countries and, and offer them a, a asylum a fair asylum procedure and help them but this is of course not enough uh, how can we get out of this uh out of this situation what is that that's the the one million euro question to you yeah. um what is your solution to this well, first of all i think we should stop considering migration as a crisis it's not a crisis it's a trend that is going to grow we, we are going to receive more and more migrants for... People. But that's why that's why I talk about actually the crisis yeah. of migration policy, in fact. Because exactly. if you look at Turkey, if you look at Jordan and other countries, they really have an issue there. Uh, and in comparison to the 450 million people we are, this is, this is not so much a crisis. Yes, and this is going to... Migrants are going to use, be used also as a... Are, are you being used as a weapon, you know, to scare European member countries? by some other countries you know. so we should stop this evil scheme whereby you know if the european union does not do something or does not agree with some some someone basically the migrants weapon is used against us in order to do that i think um there is a need for an effective policy for, for migration for instance having you know more easy visa, working visa for people that want to actually join or, uh, or arrive in Europe and work in Europe. And this could be implemented in the countries where those people are, are living. Or other ways, for instance, technology is also solutions. The fact that now I'm working and I'm sitting in my home could be implemented also in other region of the world in the sense that if I'm a company and I need to hire people, I can hire people in other countries, and this could be also efficient in terms of money that you're gonna save, you know? Like for instance, if you need if you need an IT expert, you can you could hire someone in, I don't know, Nigeria, for instance, and it would be less costly for you as a company. This is just example of working policy that could, you know, somehow help help this migration way to to, to, to be controlled and to be to be somehow faced. Um, third, I think um, 
we are a, a continent where the majority of the people are old. Um, so we will need migrants. We, we are in need of migrants. Um, and the fact that we are so scared about accepting people um, is not somehow reflecting well on our values of democracy and inclusiveness, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you know, we need to have structured policies and this cannot be left, I think, at simply national level. I think we should have more European coordinations. There are countries that, for instance, Eastern European countries, they have a problem of um, employment in the sense that there are many jobs there that could be uh, done by, by migrants arriving there. Those people need, of course, effective working permit in order to avoid illegal migration. They need to have decent living conditions. Because what I see in Italy is that the majority of the people that complain for migration are people that actually already live in a situation of economic instability. And they find themselves living in part of cities or regions where there is already you know, social issues. And uh, upon the social issue, you add also migra migrants arriving in Italy. They don't maybe speak the language, they don't understand the culture. And of course, you add an issue, a social issue upon other social issues. So I'm not saying that it's not, it's, it's easy, it's not easy, but with the correct number of policies, I think it's a problem that we can actually solve. Consider that the US and Canada were formed by migrants and you know they are perfectly functioning countries. So Italians used to migrate all over the world. So I think it's just a matter of integrate those people in the correct way. And the way to integrate those people in the correct way is to provide them then the means to, to acquire a decent life. So you know, work permit, you know, possibility to you know build a future in the country where they, they arrive. And to do that, I think we should solve the problem at the base, for instance, by providing working visa or by hiring people to stay in their country to work from okay. remote. Mm -hmm. So le legal ways, actually, to, yes. to, to Otherwise, come to the European a, Union. A, a, a weapon against the European Union constantly used by Turkey mm -hmm. or other countries. And mm -hmm. we, cannot, mm -hmm. we cannot do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Ignacio, uh, does Spain really want European solidarity on migration and border issues? I'm asking that because if you if I look at Poland, for example, they didn't really want to have any media coverage at the border. They didn't really want to have any NGOs at the border. And uh, sometimes I have the impression that this is similar to the situation in Ceuta and Melilla, where uh, Spain wants to do it alone, but don't make it public. Uh, well, I, I I tend to agree with with, with, with your question that, that that Spain is I mean asking in in broad terms about the European common migration policy, but when we you are discussing well to deploy uh, um, uh, uh, Frontex um, uh, guards in the in the border uh, and the 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 this, the, the transfer of sovereignty that does entails in terms of, well, you, uh, along with your own police forces, you are going to have European front, Frontex police is, is, is something that I really think that, that when it, 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 we have to deal with that, uh, it will be very, very controversial. Um, but also because there is this, this feeling that the European uh, approach to migration right now is just to control external border. I mean, it's not coherent. Uh, there is no real solid solidarity of those uh, countries in the, on the on the on the periphery of the European Union that, that are uh, have to have to uh, digest the, the, the arrival of, of, of migrants or as as salon seekers. And I really think that if the European Union would be more coherent, uh, uh, have a more uh, comprehensive approach to, to migration. Uh, perhaps the, the attitude uh, may change, but if the if the if the if the policy is just to control the border and help uh, Italy, Greece, Malta, Spain, or Poland now to control the border from a, 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 a only a police approach, I really think that it will be controversial for those protecting Spanish sovereignty from the right wing political forces, but also for more progressive that really think that that the European participation on that is just, I mean, uh, lower than other approach, no? Um, well, I, Ignacio, I, 
Eugenia is not here at the moment, but I remember visiting Despos and visiting refugee camps uh, in Greece. And it's uh, the European contribution is, of course, not only to control borders. There's a lot of financing involved, a lot of NGOs involved that actually build and manage those refugee camps. All the asylum procedure is actually helped uh, from, from, from other countries. Um, my impression is that uh, this is something that, that Spain rather rejects in order to have less public attention to the situation at their border. I, I, I remember in particular that it was a proposal coming from the Austrian prime minister on, on reinforcing migration policy with this approach that was rejected in, in, in Spain uh, uh, because of this idea of what, what our absolute priority is to help our partners to control the border just in order to avoid the, 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 the flow of migrants once they are in Spain or in Greece, in Italy, to, 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 to arrive to, to the uh, core of the European Union, to arrive to, to Austria, to Germany or Sweden. Uh, which, by the way, uh, absolutely, they, are, they have uh, uh, much more um, uh, refugees and, uh, and than, than, than Spain because most of them don't want to uh, remain in Spain that they want to to travel to this to the so this is a really European problem and I probably probably you 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 are right on 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 that uh, Europe is not just uh, trying to protect the the, the the external border but I my, 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 my answer was connected to your first question about what to do in uh, on, on, on on the border uh, uh, I, 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 I wanted to, to say something uh, regarding what has been said, uh, but it's not on migration. I don't know if, if I can do it right now or... Uh, be, uh, before you do that, uh, let me uh, go over to Alice. And there's a question um, coming in from David Matai Giubanu. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, David. <laughs> he has a tricky question. And, you know, I like tricky questions and I always pose them to you. Now, the question is, how do we actually reconcile the increasing migration trend that also Leonora talked about with the skepticism of EU citizens that are concerned about how migration actually impacts their life? Um, that's the, the question that we ask ourselves every day. Do you have an e easy answer to that? Obviously, from the I Portuguese don't have perspective. An easy I don't have an easy answer. I don't think anyone in this panel or even at the European institutional level has them, unfortunately. Uh, well, regarding uh, migration, refugees, asylum seekers, it's not a very controversial issue in the country because uh, as other countries, we don't have uh, um, refugees or illegal migrants on our borders every day. So. We are a uh, part of the relocation scheme. We are the country is available uh, to receive uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, some do come, but as Inacio said regarding Spain, uh, most of them also do not wish to remain in the country, and they end up uh, leaving the country uh, because we do not provide as other northern countries. Uh, the economic and other conditions that they find suitable for for living. So we do have uh, we do have that problem, but we are fully available uh, to to receive them and to welcome them. Um, the political parties in the country uh, have not been capitalizing the issue as well because, as I mentioned, it's not quite controversial. We you are actually you actually even handed out uh, Portuguese citizenship to many during the co Corona crisis, no? We granted citizenships right temporary for those who already uh, uh, filled in their papers to become Portuguese citizens. So in that case, yes, during the first lockdown, that was uh, made uh, available and possible because the Portuguese government understood that uh, nobody should be uh, away from health care and uh, social security benefits. So it did that. But... Um, the amount, the number of refugees and illegal immigrants that the country has, it's really a small proportion. So it doesn't scale up uh, and becomes uh, an important issue capitalized by Eurocentric uh, political parties. Yeah. Uh, Eleonora, um, can I come back to something that you said in the beginning? Because there's a, there's a question um, 
to you, in fact, um, when you talked about um, raising the awareness in the public that uh, European integra integration has a value added, when you talked about uh, education, um, the question uh, came in, how can you actually educate people um, to um, perceive democracy as something positive and European institution as something positive if they don't even believe in their own national institutions and if they don't trust their national government? Easy question. <laughs> Well, I believe that you don't, we don't have to educate people to be pro-European. We have to educate people about what is the EU and what is democracy. And the fact is that I think this is missing very much. Is we are missing, you know, the importance because you know we were born with democracy. We didn't go through, you know, period of you know totalitarianism or, or so we don't often appreciate the importance of our institutions and our democracy. And of course there is much that can be better. We can you know work on many things. But the point is to understanding that you know we are privileged because we live in democracy and we're pri privileged but we could be because actually if we are not if we don't like the European Union we can say so I think it's fundamental and in order to have people understanding the fact that they, they live in privileged time and they live in privileged countries for this reason it's fundamental and this you can only acquire through education but you know repeating and telling them you know you can be anti-European, you have the right to do so. It's not everywhere that you can, you, could, you, could, you have the same rights. So the fact that you are born here, the fact that you live in a democratic country is something that you should be grateful for. Um, so this is, I think, the importance of education. The fact that we are living in a time where you know, many things are, are, given, are taken for granted and, and, and it's not the case anymore. Um, that's it. And I'm not saying that everybody should be absolutely pro-European. I say I think that from my perspective, of course, being part of the European Union has been an absolute advantage for Italy. It's 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 in fact uh, interesting to see that if you look at the different countries, the role of European institutions is actually perceived very differently. You have countries where you say, well, we don't really um step back please european commission we don't really need strong european institutions because we have strong institutions ourselves and then you have other countries who would argue quite the contrary mm, our well, in Italy, it used yes. to be that italians used to trust more european institutions than the national governments because you know the high level of corruption we still have um, so they believe that European institutions could come and solve all the issues. This, this is also part of the reason why we are so anti-European now, because we could I mean, see yeah, that... This is, this, is an, this is, from my perspective, a dangerous attitude, because exactly. in, in fact, um, we are the European Union. The European exactly. Union is not somewhere far away from us. If we don't solve it ourselves, if we don't have this European responsibility to act European, well, then nobody will come and solve it, in fact. I agree. Ignat, you wanted you wanted to come in. Yeah, well, uh, I it's something that I I I don't mention in my in my chapter, but that listening to uh, to Alice, I really think that it it may be stressed. Uh, that is the the behavior of uh, Portugal and Spain on enlargement, uh, um, solidarity through newcomers. Uh, Spain and Portugal uh, suffer uh, well a, a long period of, of negotiation. I mean, it's, it's, it's now much shorter than the period that, that Western Balkan candidates are facing. But nevertheless, was in particular France. I have to say, I'm sorry to to <laughs> to name and shame uh, uh, France. Well, France has been reluctant to enlargement, not only uh, Spain and Portugal, but also uh, and United Kingdom in the 70s or 60s. Also to Austria. Uh, Austria, and now with, with, the, with, the, with the Western Balkan countries. So there are some countries that, that, that when, when there is a prospective candidate to join the European Union, are thinking about, well, the domestic, the domestic debate, uh, the, the, the advantage for the country, for the economy of the country, 
to have new members. And in the case of Spain and Portugal, it was very clear, very clear that Eastern enlargement uh, was going to be, I mean, uh, negative uh, on the on the front of uh, recipients of funds, um, and also the even the political uh, focus of the European Union was going to uh, be uh, divert to the east of the continent. And well, they, they didn't veto, they didn't uh, delay the negotiations, I mean, significantly. And now uh, it's very interesting because uh, in the case of Spain, Spain is promoting Western Balkan uh, uh, um, process of, of negotiation for enlargement. And even Spain is one of the few countries in the European Union that still thinks that Turkey should be a candidate for, for, for accession. Uh, and this is very much connected to the idea that, well, we suffer a situation of long dictatorship, we suffer to be out of the European integration process. And now that we are in, we have to be solidary with, with those who want to, want to join. And this is something, and I stop here, this is something that to some extent, it happens in the cohesion policy too. Spain, uh, even if, if you look to the to the to the budget, Spain is not going to be a recipient. I mean, of the of the uh, traditional uh, uh, regional funds because Spain is, is no is always going to to in this period it's going to be the last period in which Spain is going to receive uh, funds for regional and cohesion. Probably, I mean, to be I mean to be net recipient. But still, Spain is part of the cohesion friends, basically all the Eastern countries. And it's very difficult for Spain that was a, pro, a, a promoter of the cohesion policy in the 90s, now to change uh, attitude and, uh, and start to defend that the EU budget has to be uh, um, uh, much more, um, much less ambitious of that. So, so, so that has to do with uh, with, with, with the idea that if you have suffered a situation in which you were out of the European Union, in that you were poor and you were receiving a fund because your, your GDP was below the average, that you are going to continue to, to, to defend that. And I, I think that in the case of Portugal and Spain, contrary to France and perhaps Italy, because France and Italy were founding member states, that this is this attitude of, well, we want to be solidary because we, want to, to, we, we have to be coherent what what we uh, um, uh, what was what what happened uh, twenty or thirty years ago? I think that's that's a very uh, valid point. Elise, do you want do you want to add something to this? Well, from our from the Portuguese perspective, only adding that uh, the country. Uh, has been fully engaged over the last 35 years in the European Union project. Uh, it has been, uh, it, it is part of all the major projects of Schengen, the Eurozone. Uh, it, it will remain being an active member. Uh, the, the country is a member of almost uh, 90 uh, international organizations, but the European Union is the only one that is a full-time job for the country not only because it, it takes benefits from it, but also because it's, uh, it contributes to as well. Uh, and concluding, I think that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown in the country that the EU is not designed uh, to manage effectively crisis. And that, that is something that has to be improved, but it will only be improved if, if all member states um, agreed with, with agreed uh, with, which is uh, something complicated for an organization with uh, so many member states. I mean, there, there, there's of course, um, there are of course very uh, many complex questions also to, to the issue of further enlargements, uh, related to the issue of further enlargement. I mean, if we don't consolidate, if the, the functioning of the European Union further enlargement will be uh, very difficult uh, to actually take place, I think, but it is a political message due to uh, historic um, experience from, from Spain and, and Portugal, I, I may add. Uh, Ignacio, there's a question for you uh, regarding uh, uh, Kosovo. No, uh, just, to, just to add that, that Spain, I, I, and I, I, I would say that, that Portugal and to some extent Italy 
have never been uh, problematic uh, during ratification of the treaties, uh, uh, or when um, when accepting the, the main principle of European Union law. But, however, and this is the, the contrast between the theory and the practice, when you look to the, I mean, when you look to the performance uh, on the implementation of European Union law, perhaps uh, uh, Spain, absolutely the case of Spain, uh, much worse than Portugal, is one of the worst performers on, 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 on with infringement or by the, by the Commission and by the European Court of Justice. So, well, uh, this is also this, this contrast between being very, uh, pro-European in theory on paper, uh, and then when 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 it comes to the actual uh, implementation of, of those principles of the, the European Union law, well, there are more problems. Not because not because of a, 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 a anti-European or sceptic attitude, not 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 at all, but perhaps for problems with the capacity of administration. In the case of Spain, because we are, I mean, a, a, a country is 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 is, is very decentralized and it's, it's much more difficult to to deal with the uh, implementation of European Union law when you have so many administration and regional parliaments. But nevertheless, uh, it's interesting that that this idea of being solidary because you accept the great supranational principles. Uh, um, 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 well, uh, now we are, um, it's uh, energy is very top on the agenda of the European Union. Uh, and it is- uh, uh, That's uh, Ignacio. Uh, a concrete question regarding energy, because that's something I wanted to ask you. Um, okay. Also, uh, after after Glasgow, if I may, um, we have the impression, you know, that that Austria is very much with Germany and Luxembourg and others, very much anti-nuclear energy. Now, um, I remember that your prime minister actually announced that Spain would actually phase out nuclear energy. Is this something that has changed now with uh, rising energy prices? Because this is our impression that Spain somehow is uh, cooperating with uh, uh, with Paris on this issue. Well, uh, you know that um, Austria, Italy, Germany, Spain are countries with a, a official facing out policy on nuclear energy. Uh, Austria doesn't have nuclear energy. Well, no, no we yeah. just import it. Okay, but don't okay, tell yeah. anyone. You, you're right. You, 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 uh, and that has to do with with Chernobyl and the deb and the so politicized debates in. In, in some countries in Europe, well, we part of our uh, electricity mix comes from nuclear uh, uh, energy, but the the attitude of the government uh, is in uh, perhaps for some ideological reasons too, is very much in favor of completely phasing out nuclear policy. Uh, and but what have changed with the with the high prices in in the energy? Well, have changed that there are some debate, some debate, not in the in the coalition government. Not at all in the coalition government, but but the idea is that well, a nuclear is not the solution. Uh, even if we have nuclear energy, even if we have, uh, by the way, we don't we we can't import a, a nuclear from France because we are energetically isolated because of French lack of solidarity to facilitate electricity interconnection. By the way. Uh, um, but but so nuclear energy of Spain is basically a Spanish. Uh, produce nuclear energy, very, very, very small percentage of, of French because of this lack of uh, interconnection. But nothing has changed with, with the phasing out? Uh, no, no. Uh, the, the idea is that, that this government uh, wants to uh, finish the, the nuclear nuclear power uh, um, uh, as soon as possible. As soon as possible is, is the, even the, 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 there was this idea of to, to accelerate the calendar of, of, of um, closing. And there is some now some debate, some discussion, but not coming with not within the government, coming from I mean from media experts and some uh, and the opposition parties, and I don't think that that is something that's going to change. Also, because in the public opinion, nuclear energy is is well is not particularly popular. Um, we have also that we we had that debate twenty years ago, thirty years ago, uh, uh, we, when 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 it was the debate in Italy or Austria or Germany. And I really think that, that in my view, is a non-starter to think that nuclear is going to be the solution. Uh, Ignacio, there was another question for you, um, because you mentioned Western Balkans and future enlargement, and that, uh, like in the past, um, Portugal and Spain are quite in favor of, of these developments. What is the current position of Spain on Kosovo? 
Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, it, it, there's some change in this uh, in the last couple of years, uh, much more flexible. I mean, Spain had, uh, in my view, a very mistaken, rigid position on Kosovo uh, and with a very counterproductive connection with the domestic problems with the Basque Country and the Catalonia regarding what happened with a region declares unilateral independence. Of course, the case of Kosovo and the case of Catalonia has nothing to do, but well, the Spanish diplomacy took that approach. And I really think that now things have changed. Not, we don't expect for a recognition uh, tomorrow, uh, but uh, the Spanish government has already announced that they are going to be much more flexible. They are going to have some presence in Kosovo. So to ease uh, um, uh, because if Spain wants to play a role in the Western Balkan, absolutely has to accept some kind of uh, relation with Kosovo authorities. The idea is still is to help Serbia and Kosovo to uh, have a solution of the, of the of the issue. And when this is there is that solution, Spain will recognize. But now there's a change of attitude uh, and, and much more pragmatic, much more I mean, in my view, also much more pro-European of, well, if you don't want to recognize Kosovo right now, you have to accept the reality, uh, the facts, um, and to have some kind of, of presence in Pristina. Very quick final round. One sentence from each of you on uh, what would it need to improve European solidarity? Eleonora, your recipe. <laughs> well, actually, I think real understanding of what, what solidarity means. It doesn't mean just to take, it means to be available to give, which is quite basic, but I think if everybody will understand this, we will be in a better position today. Ignacio. The microphone. Sorry, sorry. And, 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 and all of us are Southern member state. Uh, so let me finish with, with uh, 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 well, uh, an idea about that southern member states are right in trying to to fight this intellectual uh, debate uh, with, with, within the European Union and to compete uh, with, with a new narrative, more balanced narrative. And also, I mean, in terms of solidarity, we are recipient of, of European money, but we have to also denounce that some uh, northern and wealthy countries are in, in some areas, for example, I um, mean the, the the taxation or uh, migration that 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 have also to be uh, to to accept that 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 more solidarity uh, has to be uh, delivered by the European Union. So I really think that that this idea of having and we are together today, to, today Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Are, I I really think that this and Austria, it, uh, Austria, yes, <laughs> another southern member. <laughs> I, I really think that 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 in terms of the balance of the narrative between northern perspectives and southern perspective is, is particularly possible. Alice, one sentence from you. Well, my formula would be uh, less debate among uh, member states and more uh, joint action. So a little less talk, a little more action, a little bit like Elvis Presley. And uh, this is the book, ladies and gentlemen, on European solidarity and the future of Europe. Views from the capital. It's it's. Uh, I would re recommend you get the book and uh, um, have a look at it. I think it's worth it. Uh, let me thank uh, all of our panelists. Let me thank Eleonora, Alice, Ignacio, but also Eugenia from from Greece, who sent the video for a very interesting uh, conversation on European solidarity and the different perceptions and different approaches and different views to it, and the different different issues related. I think this is going to be continued. Thank you very much also to, to TAPS and the TAPS Secretariat. Secretary. Thank you, Paul. And have Thank a great Paul. day. Keep in touch. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.